Over the years, Intel have swept a, th a few things under the carpet, and among those things was the 486DX50. For a brief time, this was the fastest x86 processor on the planet, but just how fast was it, and was it worth owning? Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and as you just heard, I would think we're going to have a look at the 486DX50 today. I hear a lot about this processor when you read about the 486, you know, had stability problems, wasn't around for very long, but I kind of want to test the performance, see if it was any good, and see if we can run into those stability problems. Uh, without further ado, I guess this is going to be a long one, so we'll get straight on with it. So if you were out of your mind, this might have been the system you would have built at a very specific point in time. The DX50 hit in June of 1991, and it was the fastest clocked 486 of the original range. The lower models being 33 and 25 MHz, if not lower. Of note is the fact that Intel never offered a model for a 40 MHz bus. That was reserved for AMD and Cyrix, and those weren't really around yet. And such options just weren't around yet. With most early 486 boards being ISO only, the DX50 was usually reserved for EISA motherboards in servers or very high-end workstations, so that the higher speed could be taken advantage of. But by 1992, the Visa Local Bus appeared, and this opened up the DX50 to a wider potential audience, albeit still prohibitively priced and out of range for most people. Remember that even by 1993, the 386DX was still outselling 486 systems by a large margin due to its lower cost and still been more than capable of running most things at a tolerable speed. On the servers and workstations with the fast 486 processors, EISA had added a further cost as it required supporting logic on the board, a bias written to use it, peripherals that work cheap and floppies to set things up, which always worked so damn well. It was awkward and definitely wasn't something that fell into the grubby hands of working class consumers. VLB, on the other hand, required barely more than the 486 CPU itself. It hangs off the memory bus of the processor, runs at the CPU bus speed, making it faster than ISA or EISA, and had comparatively less pricey peripherals. I'm not even sure the chipset had to exclusively support it as, well, it's the CPU doing the work. Needless to say, such machines were still quite expensive though, so, well in reality you probably just bought a 386 or got something second hand. So your odds of having VLB yet still weren't really all that high if you owned a computer at all. Me and some other enthusiasts discussed PCI a while back, as this did arrive in 1992 and we established that motherboards for the 486 featuring PCI did show up at this time, such as the Intel Alfredo but VLB remained king on the 486 platform for a very long time, and I've never heard of anyone using a DX50 with PCI, plus the fact said Intel motherboard wouldn't support it anyway as it tops out at 33 MHz. I don't think this is particularly useful information, but it's worth pointing out because some PCI boards did offer a clock divider to avoid stability issues that Visa Local Bus can run into at these high clock speeds. It's kind of odd how that only appeared after the chip faded from relevance. Now I can't speak for other buses like that weird double length ISA Proto VLB that I can't show you pictures of because I don't own one, or that OptiLocal bus which, well this isn't local bus, this is PISA, PISA, it's for a riser. Damn, these slots are confusing, how many damn things use this same slot? Just get bent. Now my system uses an ECSUM 486V motherboard. It has two VLB slots, but both of them seem to be master slots, and it uses the UMC 82481 and 82482 chipsets, which, well, 482 is my city's area code, so I guess I kind of like that. It supports 8-bit SIM RAM, it has 16 megabytes installed. The motherboard has no 40 megahertz option, it predates such CPUs existing. For the record, I do think it could be jumpered to run at 40 MHz, I believe the clock generator supports this, but we'll skip that today as, well, officially it doesn't do that, and as we just established, such CPUs weren't out yet. 
The Chipson Technologies F64300 VGA card found its home in this machine. In fact, you might remember me saying that it would. Despite comparatively slow memory speeds, it does about keep pace with the sought after ET4000, so we found when we tested it. But unlike that card, it doesn't have any gripes about running in a 50 MHz system, where the ET4000 usually won't start up at such a high speed. The system uses a SCSI card for the hard drive, solely because I wanted to live life dangerously, and this was notoriously troublesome on such machines. It seems to work here, but I can't speak for its long-term viability. I mean, something might go horribly wrong. Anyway, beyond the VLB cards, it's pretty normal peripherals in ISA, like uh, Serial and Parallel. Oh, and I do have a Pro Audio Spectrum 16 in here, one of the Logitech branded ones, which misses the speaker header, which is quite annoying, because I'd like to have sound playing out of my internal speaker. Oh, and it has that Mitsumi CD-ROM drive, along with its controller card. The ISA bus on these boards usually already had a divider, and it does on this one, so... It's running at really normal speed. It's only slightly off. I think 8 megahertz exactly, whereas there's supposed to be some fraction somewhere. Under that heatsink is the Intel 486DX50. It's a 50 megahertz processor on a 50 megahertz bus. No clock doubling here. Its model is SX546. I think this model was produced after Intel shrank the die from 1 micrometer to 0.6 micrometers or somewhere thereabouts. Though I'm fairly certain there are a few more knowledgeable CPU collectors than I who watch this channel and they'll probably correct me if I'm wrong. Early releases of this CPU sure struggled to keep those 1.2 million transistors cool so the die was shrunk in order to alleviate this problem somewhat. This only gets you so far, as you do still need a heatsink on it. In this case, I am tempting for it by relying entirely on the curse fan to cool this heatsink. Seems to work, but let me tell you, this CPU will heat up very quickly if you don't have adequate cooling for it. If you run it with no heatsink, it will quite happily take a layer of skin off your fingers, so be mindful of that if you want to use one. And to be honest, that goes for the early 33 MHz models. I have some early ones of those, and those things get blistering hot. It goes without saying, this is a 5V CPU, and I'm doubtful that they would be able to start at lower voltages, but you could try, I suppose, as it does work on some of the DX33s, so maybe if you get a late enough DX50, they might run at a lower voltage and actually run cooler. Obviously expect instability if you're going to try this, but I can't see that would break anything. Although if you did have a new enough board to offer socket 3 features like low voltages, you'd probably not be installing the DX50 in it in the first place as a wider range of CPUs would be available and these are all that common. Not to mention the potential hassle of getting them to run properly. It is worth remembering that other than the clock speed, this CPU is essentially the same as the more common DX33, or at least in its operation and as far as the software running on the system can tell. It just runs at a faster clock speed. Now, I'm tempted to refer to it as a P4 for the rest of the video just to confuse everybody. Uh, well, it is. That was the code name for the 486. It has no relation to the Pentium 4. The fast Pentium was a P5. Gee, thanks for that mess, Intel. Now while I'm rambling, that blue socket the CPU lives in, that's socket too. It's a mistake we all make, including me, and I'm sure as hell we'll keep doing it. We're gonna call it socket 3. It's still, I might not have another chance to talk about this subject, so what's the difference? Well, socket 2 is the third one. Yeah, that, that works. So I guess it is kinda socket 3, even though it's socket 2 and it... Oh man, this was a mess. Where do I begin? So, the original 486 fit into a 168 pin socket which had no name, so I guess it's just a socket that a 486 goes into. A 486 socket. Almost invariably a lift socket, and the CPU went into it. You need a tool to remove it that looks kind of like a weird stubby bent fork. But I guess you can use other things that you're not supposed to, like a screwdriver or a slot blank. Obviously I don't recommend this, but I'm sure we've all done it. Socket 1 had 169 pins, and was for the overdrive CPUs and the 487SX ripoff CPU that, well, I think everybody knows the story behind the 487SX by now. Nonetheless, Socket 1 showed up as either a lift or a zip, 
almost always the former still. Socket 2 is what we have here. It was designed in anticipation of the Pentium Overdrive, and it had 238 pins, though as you may have gathered by the age of our motherboard here, it predated the actual launch of that CPU by several years. At least three years. Yeah, thanks for that Intel. And apparently that CPU doesn't work with some of these boards, thanks to Intel changing the design after the fact. Socket 2 usually was a ZIF socket like mine, but lift versions of it do exist in the wild and aren't really hugely uncommon as far as Socket 2 boards go. Socket 3 is essentially Socket 2 with low voltage for the DX4 chips and other vendors running at lower voltages like AMD or Cyrix. Strangely, the pin footprint is slightly different and it has one less pin at 237 than Socket 2. As with Socket 7 boards that only offer a single rail and so only work with Socket 5 chips in any practical sense and thus might as well be Socket 5 boards, a lot of Socket 3 boards exist that don't offer any low voltage, which makes you wonder if they ought not be referred to as Socket 2 boards in disguise as well they don't really support Socket 3 chips without the use of a third party interposer. Some boards had an external voltage regulation module though, like this later ECS one, and I know Fick made one, but it was pretty bad. Yeah, thanks again for this kind of mess intel, look what you've started. Still, Socket 3 is almost invariably a ZIF socket, barring some very narrow exceptions, like, I think, some DOS on Mac cards or something that you'll never likely run into if you just want to slap a machine together and run some stuff on it. I'd bet there are some SBCs out there which used lift to save space and probably never actually used a Pentium overdrive anyway. They probably just put a DX33 in there. Socket 6 is a thing that apparently exists, but I don't know enough about that to really say anything beyond it apparently having 235 pins and only offering 3.3 volts. I don't own one and probably never will, as even if one showed up, It'd more than likely be expensive and not worth having. It's not like it'd do anything Socket 3 didn't already do, as it doesn't seem any CPU or chipset was made specifically for it. As far as I know, it only offers 3 volts, and... You know board makers would have still put a 5 volt jumper on, it, it would have just been Socket 3. Hey, now wait just a second there, something just occurred to me. If Socket 6 doesn't have 5 volts, but takes Pentium Overdrive processors... Then how are the Pentium Overdrive processors meant to work? They don't run on 3 volts. I mean, they do internally, but they have a volt reg on board. And when I set mine to 3 volts, it doesn't work. So, evidently, it's not like the voltage regulator just shuts off. So, is there like another range of processors that I don't know about that just never came to be? I mean, I theorised this before, didn't I? I said these clock generators are... The same ones are used for Pentiums, they can do like 66 megahertz and stuff. Maybe there was going to be like a low budget set of processors that used the 486 platform or something. I don't know. I mean, the specs could be wrong, it's just such an obscure socket. And like I say, even if it was meant to be 3 volts, you know the board makers would have just stuck other voltages on there anyway. So... I'm really kind of thrown by that. If that spec is correct and it was 3 volt only, why put the extra pins on it? What were those for? Like, why have the Pentium Overdrive pins there? That doesn't make sense. You stupid Intel. Thanks, thanks a lot, Intel. Well, with that bloody headache out of the way, a note about the chipset on my ECS motherboard here. I'm not entirely sure this chipset was built for VLB boards, as I'm sure I've seen it on older ISA-only boards, however, I could be wrong, as there were ISA-only boards made very late on, with the later 491 and 498 chipsets, and even the 888 chipsets, the last of which was well and truly capable of PCI, it had that built into it. So, well, that's not a guarantee of chipset age. It is, however, an older chipset than we'd usually run into these days, as most people seem to run boards made in 1993 or later, by which point this chipset had largely been displaced. It may be a sensible option to use a later board, but since when do I do sensible? I'm the guy who burns CDs on a fast generation Pentium that doubles as a video capture box, so yeah, sensible really isn't my thing, apparently. 
The board does, however, have pads for a PQFP CPU, so, well, that's something, I guess. Presumably you'd be able to disable that and use the socket anyway. I don't really know, but this motherboard certainly era correct for this CPU, at least. This would have been what was around then. Those newer motherboards, they didn't exist yet, so this is a, a realistic scenario of how you might have run a machine like this at the time. So how good is this DX50 anyway? What would this system have been like? Would it have been worth spending those four or five figures that it would have probably set you back? Well, we'll skip all the things we know the DX33 would do, because it will still do those, but it'll just do them faster. We'll move right up to one of the big boys. Yeah, Duke Nukem 3D is just about playable. In fact, I think I could get through the whole game like this. You might have to turn the detail down once or twice or shrink the screen here and there, but... Hey, you know full well I'm pretty old school with this, in that I have a much greater tolerance to shitty frame rates than many people today, if only because I was fortunate, or maybe unfortunate enough to grow up when owning a slow computer was still a luxury. I mean, it's faster than the SX25, and my 386 back in the 90s sure as hell wouldn't be able to play this thing, although I was a bit late to the party, I guess. Given the game... Given the game is from five years after the CPU appeared, I'd say this wasn't too bad, and it's putting a good performance here. The system does actually appear to be stable as well, which is something, as that can be an issue on these. These motherboards and chipsets weren't, weren't always happy running at 50 MHz, and the Visa Local Bus can be especially troublesome. At a more conventional speed of 33 MHz, VLB can push 133 megs per second of data around. But at 50 MHz, it can do about 200 megs per second, which is way faster than you probably need. I don't think any of the peripherals that go in there can really utilise it, to be honest. This was, as noted though, unstable in many cases, and Intel never released another CPU with a 50 MHz bus. Not for the 486 platform, though, well, the Pentium was meant to run at this speed initially, and then they pushed it to 60, and then went back to 50 for the 75, and... Yeah, thanks for that headache, Intel. You know, actually, 486 motherboards with Intel chipsets pretty much never had the 50 MHz option. It's as if they didn't want this to go anywhere. Oh, except uh, some Ares motherboards had it, as that chipset supported it. In, like, 1994. Long after they'd stopped bothering with the DX50. Yeah, go figure. Thanks again, Intel. As I'm still renting about stuff, Intel's 486 chipsets are bloody weird anyway. They had some features that didn't show up on Pentium chipsets for a couple of years, like the Saturn II already had PCI 2.1 in 1994, where the Pentium didn't get that until the Triton II in 1996. Given the Alfredo we mentioned earlier on the Saturn I chipset, and a bunch of other oddities, it almost seems like Intel used the 486 platform to test things on the unsuspecting general public. And you know, I could talk about this Intel chipset board I have here sometime if you want, but the short version is, don't bother with them. Just use UMC or SIS or whatever else instead. I mean, they're generally better, and cheaper, and easier to find, and there's probably a reason for that. And I can think of several good ones. Still, one thing I will tell you about this board here is it's an Asus. So yeah, you know full well how well I'm going to get on with this. And yeah, that VLB slot, it's not real. This is a 486 motherboard that doesn't have real VLB. It's a PCI bridge. The second PCI slot gets disabled when you use this. Now why is that stupid? Because plugging a VLB card in blocks the fourth PCI slot. So, well, whilst that slot can still be used technically, you know you can't use it, so you lose two PCI slots. Why not wire the VLB slot to that one? It is Asus, and it's using an Intel chipset, so, hey. I guess that's about what you should expect, right? Jeez, man, this is awful. We, we can look at it someday if you really want to. It's, uh, it's a bit of a shit show. Still, I think we might be wondering by this point where the DX266 was. Now, this CPU was extremely popular in its time, and for many reasons. For one thing, it worked in existing motherboards with minimal fuss. It offered a significant speed boost over the common DX33 and SX chips. It was probably seen as cost-effective, though almost certainly wasn't cheap because that just wasn't a thing with computers yet. 
I wonder if it can outpace our DX50 here, whether the raw clocks and bus speed of the DX50 can outrun the clock doubling and more conventional bus speeds of the DX2. I mean, I would imagine they're going to change places every once in a while. Also in this test is a DX250, which runs on a 25 MHz bus, and a DX33, obviously on 33 MHz. I say this, but in reality I'm just running the same CPUs at a different clock. I mean, that's all Intel did anyway, as far as the operation of the chip goes, so we'll get the same results. It saves me having to dig around. Hey, we might throw a couple more on there, but we're really focused on whether the DX50 was a performance king or a waste of money in its time. Going into this, as we could have predicted, in last place is the DX33, it only gets 27.3 points in 3D Bench, which is a good ways behind the DX250 with 33.4. The DX50 comes in second place with a respectable 39.4, which, yeah, that's a significant boost of around 44% over the common DX33. The DX266 outpaces it, though, with 44.5. It's 63% faster than the DX33, and it's a decent 13% faster than the old DX50 after rounding. However, this is substantially less significant clock for clock than the DX50 is over the DX33. So, I guess as you start clock doubling, you do lose a little bit of the gains that you might have got otherwise. PC player is fairly consistent with our initial findings. The DX33 at 5.9, the DX250 at 7.8, the DX50 at 8.4 and the DX2 at 9.8. I have to say, I'm quite impressed by this DX50, and meanwhile I'm finding the DX250 to be quite lacking. I guess that 25 MHz burst really is crippling things a little bit. Top bench results aren't so sparse. The DX33 is at 140, DX250 at 155, DX50 at 192, which is pretty good, because the DX266 can only pull 195. This is quite close, and given this test is an amalgamation of a few things, it may be an indication of things to come. In SpeedSys, we find that the DX33 is, of course, the slowest of the group, with a measly 12.35 CPU score. The DX50 falls to third place in this one with 18.62, but it's by such a narrow margin that it could have been temperatures or solar radiation throwing it, because 18.55 is the DX250's score. We might as well say they scored the same, and conclude that internally, clock for clock, the CPU core could probably keep up, and it's really the bus that's the source of the problems for that DX2, losing it points over the original DX50. The DX266 is just off in the distance somewhere with 24.77. It seems right, it's about 33% faster. Memory bandwidth gets a little bit weird. The DX33 is of course slower at only 27.14 megs per second, but the DX266 comes in third in this test, 27.19. The DX250 is strangely 30.13 despite the lower bus speed, so maybe some hidden timings or weights change somewhere on the motherboard when this CPU is installed, or that, I mean, when that bus speed's selected. Or maybe something funny's going on with the processor, and, or the RAM itself, I, I really don't know on that, it's kind of weird. The original DX50 is only marginally faster at 31.43, but it does come in fast in this test, so it has won something over later CPUs, which, yeah, I guess that's alright. It's not major, but kind of cool. As we could have predicted, the Visa VGA speed does change relative to the VLB clock, meaning the DX250 is the worst at 13 megs per second. The DX266 is in third place here, 16 megs per second, leaving a DX33 to overtake it somehow at 70 megs per second. You know, maybe clock doubling does screw up addressing things on the memory bus, and the DX50 to take the lead with 18 megs per second. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, jeez. I don't think you really notice that much. I mean, it's VGA. It's not like the card has acceleration, has to stick a load of textures in memory or anything. Still, that DX250 sure does look pretty pathetic here. Again, it's due to that slow bus speed, and I'm not impressed by it. But given the DX2 didn't exist in the time of the original DX50, I am impressed by the DX50. 
as it's quite a lot faster than the common DX33 for sure, which really would have been the only other option. It definitely does drive the video card harder, and if you can get it to work without a bunch of weight states, I really don't think you'd have any bottleneck there beyond the card itself, although, having said that, I guess you'd only run into that at higher resolutions, and then in demanding applications that would do that, you'd probably really want a Pentium class CPU anyway before you start pushing those, so... I guess, again, that's a whole argument unto itself. Still, level 1 cache seems to be affected by both bus clock and internal CPU clock. The DX250 is the slowest, it's 31.54. The DX33 is a bit faster at 35.16. The DX50 is 47.23, and the DX266 is barely passing it now at 48.94. L2 cache is a similar story, the DX250 being slower at 22.14, followed by 27.34 for the DX33, and the DX266 trailing behind the DX50 for once, pushing 36.39, where the DX50 can crank out 36.91. A keen eye might have noticed that the 256k of cache I have installed is made up of 20 nanosecond chips, and I will talk about this a bit more later, because I'm sure somebody is really ticking about this somewhere. I have my reasons, don't worry, I, I know full well what I'm doing there. Memory throughput is largely related to bus speed, it seems. The DX250 is really slow at 12.85, the DX33 probably bottlenecks it on the CPU rather than the memory interface itself, 17.25. The DX266 is 21.21, but the DX50 pulls 23.75, which is a decent enough boost, but it's actually not as much as I would expect to see, and it's as if the platform itself bottlenecks instead, that being the motherboard and the supporting logic on it, like the chipset. Heed my foreshadowing just a moment ago, because we'll get there. It is weird how the fast chunk of the memory read line in SpeedSys seems to reflect the clock speed regardless of the final results. I have a few theories on why, but I don't suppose it matters too much here. I just thought it was kind of novel to see that moving around. Now Doom is Doom. I'd not really want to play it on a 486 personally at all, because it has id syndrome, the engine is quite a bloated mess, and it doesn't really run very well considering how little it's doing. It is good for benchmarking though, and the DX33 comes in last, it only gets about 14 frames a second. The DX250 sits around in third, just short of 20 frames a second. The old DX50 gets ahead of this, just north of 21 frames a second, and the DX266 predictably runs out in front. It gets just over 25 frames a second, and it bloody should, because that CPU was more common when the game launched. The DX50 was a little old by then, and I'd consider its performance here quite satisfactory when compared to its contemporary, the DX33. Again, you really do have to remember that that was really the, the only other option. The DX2 wasn't out yet. Quake will slog on these chips, but it gives some indication of floating point performance. 4 frames a second for the DX33, 5.5 for the DX250, 5.8 for the DX50, and 7 for the DX266. It's all a bit crap really, but it's kind of novel seeing how things don't seem to scale linearly with clock speed. And also how the losses clock for clock might actually be slightly worse on the DX266 than the DX250, but I'm not really sure. I, I, I need more data to really figure that out, and I'm not that interested in that. Still, what's the moral of this story? The DX250 is kind of crap, and I doubt anyone fell for it but OEMs. The original DX50, though, which was the purpose of this, is really quite fast. Remember, the DX2 chips didn't exist yet, and there were no 40 MHz chips. Which means that it was either a DX33 or slower, or the DX50. Compared to the DX33, it's night and day. If you could get a DX50 at the time and get it to work, it would have been mighty impressive, and to be honest, you probably wouldn't have needed to upgrade to a DX2 once those came out. Still, there's the problem. Getting it to work. You'd surely want VLB as a consumer. It's faster, 
and cheaper than EISA, which was already long in the tooth by then, and had relatively little time left. But it wasn't really meant to scale to this clock speed and is prone to problems. Meaning, ironically, EISA did have an advantage in that regard over VLB. There is an interesting thing going on here, though, in that I feel the platform is about at capacity. We probably could go faster with that CPU, because removing weight states with the DX50 in this board doesn't yield any increase in score. But it does on slower CPUs, if only a little. It's as though a wall has been hit, and things just won't run any faster no matter what you do. So that cache? There's no need to put faster chips in this board. The 20 nanoseconds ones can handle the clock just fine, and have been in there since the system the board came from was built somewhere in the early 1990s. This older chipset simply doesn't seem able to shove things hard enough to be of a concern here. And even then, you can get more out of 20 nanosecond chips than you really would think. A lot of paranoia about the latency of cache chips, which I think is a bit misplaced sometimes. Unless you're extreme overclocking or something. Still, would this allowance for sloppy latency and this weird performance wall be the case on a later board? Well, probably not. You could get way more performance on, say, a UMC 498 board, I'm fairly certain. And we will test one of those in a moment. But remember, such things didn't exist yet. So we're using age-appropriate hardware, and this is what you would have got, and what you could have expected from a DX50 in the time it was around. And it is still quite impressive. It's much faster than the DX33 was. As for running a later board, well, the DX266 would have been out by then. I don't even think it was a year before this displaced the DX50. And depending on how late you were getting that newer motherboard, competing AMD and Cyrix processors might have been on the shelves by then, and those were cheaper than Intel's options, so you would have used a DX2 instead at that point, whether it be from Intel or another vendor. So, some additional tests. What would happen if we put a Cyrix in there? Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. I'm going to go on the record and say I like Cyrix, and I'm not actually going to go through these scores, because this board doesn't like the chip. It seems to be too old to support it, at least on the BIOS version it's running. It has some serious issues with it. The L2 cache stops working, and, well, as the board isn't compatible... We're just not going to bother factoring the results in. Uh, this CPU came out a good ways after this motherboard, so, you know, it, it's perfectly far. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong in either case. They're just, they're too far apart from each other. The UMC U5S, however, does work. In fact, I haven't found a board that these weren't working yet. This chip wasn't out yet either, but UMC were a bit more meticulous with backwards compatibility. And what would it do here, running at 33 megahertz? Well, it's not that far behind. It's actually faster when it comes to memory bandwidth, which makes me think Intel chips just weren't very good at this. It also drives the VGA card way harder than you'd expect. It has faster level 1 cache, and it does manage 17 frames a second in Doom. In short, the UMC leaves an equivalently clocked Intel CPU behind, even in this older board. It can outpace the DX50 in places, though the DX50 is probably faster overall in the real world. Or is it? The UMC chip was made a good way later than the DX50, so it would have been around when newer boards had already appeared, and it was quite cheap. It also uses very little power, and it doesn't need a heatsink. It doesn't have a floating point unit though, so I guess you're out of luck if you need that. Well, let's see how much difference having a later motherboard with a newer chipset can really make to a system. This is my U5 SD40 machine, and you probably know I have a long history with this one, and it's one of my favourite systems. She was still holding a couple of records last I checked too. So how will this 40 MHz UMC machine from a year or two after the DX50 was breaking ground hold up against said DX50 on an era-appropriate board. Well, let's wipe the Cyrix test off the chart. It's completely invalid due to the compatibility issues, and put the U5 SD40 system in that spot instead. Yeah, forget the DX50. The UMC matches the DX266 in 3D Bench. 
it also matches it in PCP Bench and still leaves the DX50 for dead. It obliterates absolutely everything in Top Bench. With a CPU score of 22 in Speed Sys, it scarts the DX266's 24.77, more so than the 18.55 of the DX50. That newer motherboard is really going to be helping out here, I'm sure. In memory bandwidth, the... Mm, yeah, uh, let me fix that. In memory bandwidth, it's a bit of a lost cause. From the 20s and 30s to triple figures is not to be scoffed at. That poor DX50 is just having the floor wiped with it. Visa speed is also way faster here, though we know the ET4000 can run quicker in this regard, even if it doesn't really prove too useful in the real world versus the CNT, because the overall performance of the card seems to be the same at any resolution you would realistically be using on such a system, where it just doesn't really become a problem all too often. By now you'll not be surprised to see the L1 cache is faster here as well, nor will you be surprised to see that the L2 cache is a decent ways ahead. Memory throughput is a little closer, but the newer system's still ahead. The DX266 still holds up in Doom though, with its 25 frames a second. The U5SD can still pull off over 22 frames per second quite happily, however, so it's quite competitive. I feel confident saying that the glory of the DX50 was short-lived. It was a very capable chip in its time, but it was pushing at the limits of the platform at that time too. If money was no object and you really needed that speed immediately, there was no contest whatsoever. But once the DX2 and faster motherboards arrived, along with competing CPUs, the party was over all too soon, and even a comparatively low-cost system would have been able to catch or even surpass it. Although if you earned a DX50 already, there probably wouldn't be any need to upgrade for a few yards at least. Is it worth having one today? Not really. They can be stubborn to set up. Finding a board to run one can be awkward, whether it be because you opted to go for costly EISA and the hunt for such peripherals, or because you decided to try and run VLB at such a high speed, the older boards from the time the chip was around aren't even all that quick at such high clock speeds, as the supporting technology just wasn't quite there yet, and things really start running into a wall. As such, it's really only recommended for the serious hobbyist who does it for the joy of playing with the machine at least as much as actually using it. But if you just want to fire up a few games, or run Windows 3.1 or something, as they're just better than the old ones in almost every single regard. Personally, I do like this system, but it might not stay around for long. I mean, let's face it, my UMC is better for the reasons I just gave. But at the same time, I do quite like this quirky thing in a weird sort of way. It's not a common chip to see now, and it really never was, but... For a brief time, it was the king, and that just appeals to me for some reason. For barely a year, possibly less, nothing could touch it, but it quickly fell into the annals of history and was paid little regard from then on. Anyway, back to that prick in front of the camera. I've got a headache now. Thanks, Intel. So there we go. That's the 486DX50. <laughs> Test against a few other chips and a newer system. As you can see, its glory was short-lived, but certainly if you needed that performance in that time and money was no object, then yeah, nothing really got close to it. So I do think this was, uh, if you could get hold of one at that point, would have been pretty good and you probably wouldn't have had to upgrade it for a while. And even then you would have had a little bit of upgrade room to the DX2 maybe later, but uh, really by the time you need to think about that, you might as well have just got a Pentium or... Or a K5 or, or whatever, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, we didn't run into any of the instability. Uh, the thing about that is that SCSI card and that graphics card are a bit later than the rest of the machine, and so probably built with that in mind. As we established, like, the ET4000, don't seem to like that, that bus speed. Uh few cards though, I've heard SCSI controllers really hate it, but mine seems to be fine with it, but mine has jumpers for it. So I, again, I can see why it would be a problem, and I can imagine that was probably really annoying back then. Uh, you know, if you bought this stuff and it didn't work, then yeah, not really so much you'd be able to do. I hope you'd be able to retard it, and uh, good, good luck with that. Uh, 
as I said in the video, the motherboard is a bit old, but it's era correct for this CPU. So I don't doubt if we stuck that CPU in my, you know, 498 board or whatever it is, it probably would perform a lot better than it does in here. But this is a performance you would have got out of the chip at the time. This is what you could expect. It seems to be hitting a wall for the platform at this point. Like the the boards are about even at lower clock speeds, like say 33 megahertz. There's not much in it, but as you once you go beyond that, the later chipset and the you know it it just performs better than this one. This one hits a wall, and so at 50 megahertz, adding or removing weight states does absolutely nothing to the performance. It just it hits the wall. It's as if things just won't go any faster. I don't think that chipset was built when VLB was out. I think it predates it. That may be a factor, even though it's directly leeching off the CPU to all intents and purposes, Visa Local Bus. That may well be a thing, and maybe there's something with the cache controller and the memory controller. I don't really know, but again, I I feel it's right to use this board, you know, I feel what we're getting is accurate because this is what motherboards were like when the CPU was around, they weren't quite as mature yet, and of course by the time they were, you had more processors, you'd probably use a DX2, which as we know, very popular processor, and I don't think that's unjustified whatsoever, I, I think the DX266 is, is rightfully a, a popular choice at that time. Certainly seems like the sort of thing I would have gone for, you know, if I'd have been doing this back then, but uh, I was still kids, so, yeah, I was a few years off yet. Uh, it was it was an interesting thing, and, uh, yeah, it's it's not a bad machine, actually. It's, it's growing on me, but, uh, uh, I don't know. We'll see what the future holds for it. I mean, my UMC is definitely the better machine, but well, that doesn't mean this thing's no good, so I really don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> we'll see, I suppose. Anyways, I don't really have much else to say. Um, I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time around for whatever the hell we do. I'm not quite sure yet. I have some ideas, as always, but whether they come to fruition or not is is very much a different story, isn't it? So, as, as usual, I guess remember, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 6.2 to it or else.